this morning, let's uh, take our Bibles and let's turn to the Word of the Living God that we have been studying together for the past couple of weeks. That book is the book of Ecclesiastes. It's in your Old Testament. Uh, it's not hard to find if you have a device, right? You just scroll down and click and you're there. <laughs> but it's there in the Old Testament. comes right after Psalms and Proverbs. So if you're finding it, locate that and we will read our passage this morning beginning in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the first 15 verses. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing, a time to search and a time to give up as lost, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart and a time to sew together, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I've seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He's made everything appropriate in its time. He's also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks these goods and all his labor, it is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There's nothing to add to it and there's nothing to take from it for God has so worked that men should fear him. That which is, that which is, which is, has been already, and that which will be, has already been, for God seeks what has passed by. It's important and it's really necessary if we're going to have a good understanding of this book that we began studying, the book called Ecclesiastes, it's really important that we comprehend what the big picture is here. What, what's the canvas of this book? Because if you don't, you tend to find yourself wandering through some verses particularly and having no clue what those really are all about. It's important for us if we're going to understand what these verses even this morning are trying to remind us about is that we understand the big picture that the writer of Ecclesiastes has in mind. And the connection that goes through all of this book is this phrase about vanities. The vanities of vanities, says the preacher, is all vanity. So the writer of Ecclesiastes, as he begins to talk about these vanities, which he opens the book with in chapter 1, verse 2, and then he closes the book in chapter 12, verse 8, with that phrase, it's his way of telling us over and over again that what he is experiencing in this journey of life in this world, from cover to cover, from front to end, from the start to the last, is all summed up in this one word called vanity. Now, when we think of the word vanity, often what comes to our mind is a very prideful person, right? You're so vain, right? You, you just want to break out into that song, right? And start singing that. <laughs> I just about did. <laughs> and so you think of vanity in that term, but that's really not what it is. What it is, is a Hebrew word that really pictures the idea of things just being like a vapor, like the breath that you breathe out. You really can't get hold of it, right? It just, when you try to grab your breath, you can't do it, right? And you breathe it out and it goes and it's, it's gone. And that's the way life is. Life is a lot in this world, apart from God, is intended. And you'll see in this passage, God set it up this way that you would feel the emptiness, the loneliness, and the frustration that life in this world brings. 
That's not the devil making it that way. That's God making it that way. And the writer wants us to understand that as he comes to this and shows us that he is on this journey and what he has concluded is, listen, life doesn't make sense in this world if you leave God out of it. And so one way to picture the overall canvas of this is kind of like a picture with a lot of scenes on it. Picture this canvas and there's just one scene after the other and it's full of one disappointment and one frustration with a little glimmer of some happiness here and there. But in the end, when you stand back and you look at it, you just go, that's such a discouraging looking picture. I mean, if it were a painting, you probably wouldn't hang it in your house. Somebody would come and say, well, what is that? And you say, well, that painting is called Vanity. <laughs> Well, if I were you, I'd get rid of that thing because that's really not too encouraging and exciting at all. And that's the picture that the writer wants us to understand here. That's what connects all the pieces together. Solomon is on this journey, and he's a man who has had everything you could have in this world. He's experienced everything you could experience in this world. And so he actually, someone, I don't know who said it, but it sticks in my head, said that Solomon made Elon Musk look like a bum living under the bridge. That's just what he had. And yet Solomon's saying, at the end of all this, it really adds up to nothing. So how does, how does Solomon help us see over and over again in this canvas, this story, this picture, how life is meaningless and hopeless and without really purpose if you leave God out of it. Well, in our passage this morning, what he does is he gives us a poem. And that poem is in verses three or verses two through eight. And in your notes there, you'll see I've noted that that's called a mirrorism. A mirrorism, it's a really fancy word for simply saying what it's gonna do is take some words, combine them together, their opposites, and the idea in the mirrorisms is to give you kind of a glimpse of a big picture here. So like if you wanted to say they searched everywhere, you could use the mirrorism of they searched high and low, right? You wouldn't be thinking literally they looked up there and they looked down there, but they looked everywhere. The biblical type of mirrorisms that we have in the scripture are phrases like heaven and earth. And when you read about heaven and earth in the Bible, you're not thinking about, well, the sky and the ground. You're thinking about everything above and everything below, everything. That's what a mirrorism does. And you'll notice in this poem that Solomon gives us about time, he starts out by giving us the bookends of the mirrorism by saying there's a time to give birth and a time to die. And he's not just thinking about birth and death, he's thinking about everything in between, which is why the following verses, verses 3 through 8, those mirrorisms are about all the things in life that we go through and we experience. And so he gives us this poem here, and, and I know that when we read it, we probably are more interpreting uh, those verses through the songs that we grew up with than the way Solomon wants us to understand it. The birds, as you remember, not the B-I-R-D-S, right? For those of you who don't know that, this is not birds sitting in a tree. This is birds with a guitar, B-Y-R-D-S, okay? So these birds wrote this song writing to, out of this passage here. To everything there is a purpose, turn, turn, turn. And people were singing it all over the world back in that day and didn't even realize they were singing the Bible. And their view of what that was all about was really more interpreted through their life and their experience rather than what Solomon is after here. The times, they're changing, says Bob Dylan. That's what he wanted to remind us of when he wrote. Jim Croce said that time is in a bottle. The Beatles sang about yesterday and how they believed in it and longed for it. And Sitting on the Dock of the Bay by Otis Redding is probably a great song about wasting time, right? <laughs> Does anybody really know what time it is, asked Chicago? And I would think, based on how they were living at that time, they probably didn't even know what time it was, right? <laughs> and the list could go on and on. That's not my purpose here to give you discographies of songs and people and stuff like that. But just to say, we are more prone to 
interpreting what we read here in chapter 3 based on songs that we've heard rather than really grasping what Solomon is after. And I know some of those songs I mentioned to some of you are sitting there going, who in the world is that? Who's Chicago, right? I mean, I don't even know. Poor you. I'm just... <laughs> But I did, because I told somebody one time, I said, if you ask me about any song after 1979, I have no clue who that is. That's when I came to Christ. I kind of just lost touch with all this kind of music and singers in a secular sense. But I did find myself really wondering if people were still writing about time after 1979 and writing songs about it, and they were. And you'll see again in the point why I'm telling you these in just a moment. In 1998, One Moment in Time was by Whitney Houston. It was the theme song for the NBC's coverage of the 1988 1988 Olympics. But it was a song about the fear of falling short, of failing. And then on the other end, the thrill that can come if you achieve your moment. In 2003, Coldplay wrote a song about urgency and time slipping out of your hands. And at least that's what people say the song's about. I read the lyrics and I am clueless about what they're even talking about in the song. And of course, you'd have to throw Adele in that group of writers who write songs about time. And she tells those to listen to her and to hold on. Let time be patient, she says. You are still strong. Let pain be gracious. Love will soon come. Just hold on. Hold on. Now, I'm not here to give you discographies of songs and talk a lot about those songs, but they do point out something I want you to hear. They all missed the point. (laughs) None of them got it really right. None of those songs, they're quoting the Bible, they're singing the Bible, and they're clueless about what Solomon is after here. Here's the point. The point of this poem here, these mirrors that are there, the point is so that when you look at all of the full range of human and natural experiences of life that we have, each one cancels out the others. There's 14 pairs, 14 pluses and 14 minuses. Born, die. And the point of that is, when you add all of that up, it really comes up to a zero, a big, fat zero. Now, the purpose of that poem there, and the purpose in the point, is not here for elaboration on what do you do at birth? What do you do at death? What do you do when you plant? What do you do when you reap? What do you do when you have peacetime? What do you do in wartime? That is not the point at all. He didn't even care to talk about and make any remarks about that. He didn't elaborate at all. He doesn't help us evaluate them as good or bad, wise or foolish, righteous or sinful. You can't go through the list and do that because that's not what the list is about. He doesn't tell us what we would be the best thing to do in those times. He doesn't tell us to capture the positive times and really avoid the negative stuff in here. He doesn't tell us to do that because that's not his purpose at all. If you want that kind of information, you go to the book of Proverbs. That's the book of wisdom. But this is a book of vanity. This is a book of life that just doesn't add up in this world if this is all you got. And so it's simply this list of the seasons of life that come and go, the 14 pluses and the 14 minuses, to bring us to the conclusion, in and of itself, life adds up to a zero. And um, I'm thinking... That's probably not how most people read that. If I were to modernize the text and maybe plug in real life examples in there, maybe you'd get a little more feel in modern vernacular kind of what Solomon is wanting you to feel here. It goes something like this. There's a time for a healthy pregnancy and there's a time for a miscarriage. There's a time when you can have fun with your kids And then there's a time when they're too cool to be seen with you as teenagers. There's a time when your babies are in diapers. And then there's a time when you wonder if you can afford all the groceries to feed them. There's a time when you're earning a salary. And then there's a time when you wonder if you saved enough for retirement. There's a time for chemotherapy. And there's a time for remission. There's a time of long love in marriage. And there's a time for the lonely and dark days after the funeral. Now there's a time for diplomacy in the world and there's a time for unavoidable conflict. 
And when you feel that, and hear that, you just get the idea, this is what he wants you to feel about life under the sun, life in this world. To be fair, when I was looking at songs and stuff, one group kind of got it close to right. A group who I've never listened to, have a little desire to listen to, called Hootie and the Blowfish. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. You know, I kind of little, read a little bit about how they got the name. But Hootie and the Blowfish in the 90s came away with a little closer expression of what Solomon is wanting us to feel here. It's a song about time. And it's a song that really talks about the haunting troubles that time brings. It talks about time as punishment. The song says terrorizing things about time, like the fact that it crushes dreams, causes tears to fall, brings all kinds of pain and sadness into your life, and is an enemy rather than a friend. Time does not comfort. Time haunts because it's fleeting and filled with sorrow that cancels out joy. Like watching sand run through the hourglass, you watch your life run out. And I say they got it right to a degree, but they missed what Solomon is going to do, which is point us to where we really find life. So as we come to this passage this morning, uh, as we think about life is meaningless, and we're going to see how it only makes purpose and meaning to us if we see Jesus in the midst of that. Those very things that we go through don't make sense. They are disappointing. They are disheartening. They are discouraging. They are things we just wish we would, could get out of. Without Jesus, you don't have any good way of looking at those things. And that's what we're going to learn. So let me just quickly walk you through a couple things I've drawn from my think, thinking and conversation with the Lord this week about these things. First of all, we have a couple problems when we think about time. And we struggle with the issues of life in this world and what goes on. Whenever we encounter the different seasons, the times we go through, what it does is it brings out stuff and it reveals stuff, right? Here's a couple of them. One, it reveals that we have a reactive view of time. We're very reactive. In other words, what we're always thinking of most often when we go through the seasons are, what are we going to do? How do we do that? What do we do about that? We have that what do we do question on our mind as we look at those times. And as we look at those seasons that Solomon mentioned, we tend to do in the midst of those life changing circumstances, things that we think will help or figure out how to get through it. And I'm not saying that that's not somewhat wise, but you're missing the point of what time is supposed to teach you if that's what you're doing. Time is not about learning how to be a manager of time, though we should be. I've told people before that I love lists, right? If you know me, you know I love lists to accomplish. I even have a digital format that I use every day of my life. I got up this morning, first thing I was greeted with, 13 things to do today. I love, I don't just like lists. Let me make this real clear. I love lists. And I love my list so much that I just have sheer delight when I go, check. <laughs> I mean, it just, it just does something for me. And if I do something in my day, you ask Pam, and it's not on my list, it goes on the list. So I can have the sheer delight of checking it off. <laughs> and I'm not saying there's anything. But before you start thinking, I need to talk to Pastor Kevin after this. He's probably got OCD or something. <laughs> Before you go down that path and before you start thinking, I got some Bible verses for him. He's probably got idolatry in his heart and he's probably kind of got an idol he needs to deal with. Before you go there and miss the whole point, let me just tell you this. In managing and organizing our time, trying to be, as it were, reactive to it and responsive to the time we have, even if you manage your time, even if you do as good as you can, at the end of the day, what you should and will discover over and over again is that really you don't control anything. And what you should feel and you should experience very often is the frustration of that in your life. Because that's what we are supposed to feel. We're not to be happy, oh, I got my list done. I can do this. I can do that. That is not the intended purpose here. We are very reactive. We tend to do things. Now, I'm not, again, saying we shouldn't plan and try to structure life and all that. We are all 
active and we take responsibility in so many ways. We buckle up the car seats, right? We, we drive the speed limit. We eat organic health food. We plan up and save for retirement. We do all those things. But in the end, if you don't let time teach you this important lesson that really it's out of your control, you're not learning what you're supposed to learn about life in this world. It should frustrate you. It should remind you that you are out of control. So we have this reactive view of time. Here's the second thing we have. We have a real restlessness when it comes to time. We have a restlessness when it comes to time. Notice what he says here in this passage. What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I have seen the task or the burden which God has given to the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. In other words, the frustration that we feel in life as we go through the seasons of life, the different things in life, actually the result of the frustration and the disappointment that it brings is a God-given burden. Yes, what profit is that? I mean, really, what's the point? I mean, I seem to get ahead, then it goes back. If this is a good time, then we go through the bad times. All of that is happening back and forth. And he says, this is what I have seen. This is the task or the burden which God has given to the sons of men. And I bet you never stop to think about that frustration and that just like disappointment with stuff. Even the happy things that come and then go away. I bet you never stop to think, wow, that's really God's design. That's really something God has tasked us with and put on us, and that is the burden on our heart. I mean, you might attribute it to some like frustration demon or like somebody else that's getting in your way, but the real point of all of that in the seasons you go through is for God to bring you to the place of disappointment with everything you can do or accomplish on your own in this world. You see, the Bible teaches us that we were all, all of us, created by God. We are what we often refer to as image bearers. We are to reflect God. And we were made as image bearers that we might live the life that he created us, which is a life made for him. And when we try to live that life foreign to our design, like, I don't need that. I'm, I don't need that God that made me. I can live my own life. I'll find my own happiness. I'll make life make sense. It'll be fun. I'll get the enjoyment. It'll bring meaning to me. When we try to live the opposite of the way we were created as image bearers, and we try to live in this world that way, it's no reason that we find ourselves so unhappy and frustrated with whatever we go through. Or the moments that we have the sides of the joy and the fun, that they're brief and they don't last and we're disappointed again. You see, we were never meant to find life in this world. It's kind of like loving the gift of this world and everything he's given us and ignoring and forgetting about the giver of the gift. We're like the children of Israel who Jeremiah spoke to in his day when he said to them in Jeremiah 2 verse 13, for my people, my people, this is my people, I'm not talking about the world out here. I'm talking about you. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hewn out for themselves cisterns or wells, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What he's saying is that where your real life comes from is me. That's what I made you for. But what you were doing is saying, I can get it in this world. I can find it in this world. It's here. In fact, it's the picture of the well with the water coming out of it. It's busted at the bottom. It's broken. But what they are doing is putting their mouth to the well, sucking as hard as they can, going, I know it'll satisfy me. It'll meet my need. That's what we've done. Now, this is not in your notes, and this is the way my preaching goes. Like, it's finished. My text is when I walk through the door, okay? And when I was this morning thinking about this, I added something after I printed the, build, the bullet or printed the outline that I thought this would maybe help clarify what we tend to do. You see, it's, it's what we really happens in our heart when we think that's image bearers, that we don't need the God who made us. Our life, our satisfaction really isn't ultimately found there. What we are doing is turning to something else or someone else that we think will do that. And it's called idolatry. It's loving and desiring and finding our happiness and our life in something other than God. And I want you to notice how, how that statement says it in that little graphic there. It's making good things the ultimate thing. See, idolatry isn't all about like bowing down in some sexual sin to an idol and committing things that are just, you all would say, that's horrible. 
It's taking good things, real important things, necessary things, things in this life that God has given us as a gift and making those things the ultimate thing. This will make me happy. And a little formula goes kind of like this in my mind. If I have Jesus, got to have him, plus, and you fill in the blank, if I get to have the pleasure I want to go have, the fun I want to go have, if I get my plans done the way that I want to, if they all work out the way I want to, if I have someone to like me, to appreciate me, Jesus plus that, listen, that'll satisfy me. Jesus minus you take any of those things away that you think, you lose them, you don't have them anymore, and you're dissatisfied. You and I are living like idolaters. We are living our lives, finding our happiness like the children of Israel in a broken cistern that well is never going to satisfy you and it's good things too you can put ministry in there you can put people to support you in there you can put uh your 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 sermon you like anything you want if i have jesus plus that that'll make me happy but if i don't get that i'm going to be really sad you have just told your own self and you have just realized that what in time you are supposed to be and that is restless, unhappy, unfulfilled in those things. Because that's what it does. So the burden that God gives to us and he brings to us, the, the preacher says here in Ecclesiastes 3, is to make us realize we were created for his pleasure, to find our pleasure in him, and to enjoy the things that he has given us in this world in relation to him. But you leave him out of that equation and you're going to be one disappointed, unhappy person. Life will not make sense. So that's the problem. We are reactive. We've got to fix things. We think about just do this and do that and manage things. Life will be better. But it still falls apart. We become restless as we should and start thinking, is this it? This is, all we, this, this, this is what life is meant to be like? 14 pluses, 14 minuses, a big zero? Is that it? Well, the final thought I want to give you is that as we think about this problem of being reactive and restless, it should point you somewhere. What it should do is it should point you to the right perspective that the writer of this chapter, the preacher, wants us to know. And that is, the right perspective is, is we should have a redemptive respect, perspective. We should have a redemptive view of time. We should really come to be able to answer the question, this is how I really find meaning. This is where life makes sense. Now notice this right here in the passage. It says, he has made everything appropriate in its time. He has set eternity in their heart. It said that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. Now, a couple of those are really easy to understand. It's that last little phrase there. He has set, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. That's a little confusing. I get that. But let's kind of put it together and you'll see why he says that. When it says that God, when you look at time from God's perspective, God's in charge here. God is doing something. I'm looking at it from, from, from eternal perspective. When you do that, you realize, wow, God does things that are beautiful, that are appropriate. It means that they're just right. Everything I'm going through, whether it's the fun time, whether it's the hard time, whether it's the beginning or the end, whatever those times are, if I really look at it that way and I begin to get a redemptive and eternal view, how God's using that for his purposes, I can say, wow, that's beautiful. That's right. That's good. You see, God is the God who, when he created the world and everything in it, he perfectly fit everything together so that it fit and it was right. And we live in a culture that keeps trying to undo that, right? Particularly in gender issues. Let's, let's kind of get undone with that stuff. We don't need to have that kind of view. But in the beginning, God made everything perfect. He made it right. He put all the pieces together. And in time right now, he continues. If I believe Romans 8, 28 and 29, he's working all things together for good to make everything right and beautiful which is ultimately to make me like his son. We get that, okay? God does the right things. He is good. He does it right. He makes everything appropriate, and it's time. Just at the right time, he does it. 
But not only that, we understand what it means that he puts eternity in people's hearts. That means people realize there's something more than this world. It takes a lot of faith to be an atheist, right? I mean, a lot. You would have to really dumb down your brain so much and your natural conscience and everything that God has made in you to just think there wasn't more beyond this world. So we understand it. He's made everything perfect. He's doing all that he's doing. It's right. It's good. He, we know there's something beyond this life. There is eternity. But what does he mean yet so that man will not find out? And here's the best way I know how to explain this. While we start looking at life from God's perspective and we see the world and everything in it through those eternal redemptive lens, the God who has loved us and saved us and redeemed us, as we start looking at that, we can say, you know, that's really not fun. I really hate that situation. I wish it would go away, but God is working something good. Very appropriate, very beautiful. I may not see it now, but he is. I believe that because I believe there's something bigger than just the world I'm in. There's an eternity. God has made us aware there's a bigger thing going on than just what's happening right now. And yet, listen very carefully. No matter how much you can see the fingerprints of God in those situations, you're still going to scratch your head and say, I can't really figure it all out. <laughs> I don't really get it. That's what he means by, so that man, he'll not find it out. You're not going to get on that level with him and understand it completely. You're going to have to trust him. You're going to have to realize he's bigger than you, wiser than you, more in control than you. And life only makes sense when I look at that and say, that's really good. God is doing something good. I'm not sure why he's doing it this way or that way, but it is good. And he's doing it because I know there's something bigger than me. There's the eternity. There's God in control. And he knows what he's doing. I can't find it out. I can't fully figure it out. I'll just have to trust him. Well, I could go on. And on. Let me just read what C.S. Lewis said when he described life in this world and what it's intended to do. He says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. <laughs> if none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that country and help others do the same. That's the right way to look at it. That's what the writer is trying to get us to see. Time, the seasons you go through and I go through, they are meaningless without Christ. So, how do we do that? I'm just going to skip about 10 pages and just get to the end, okay? So don't worry. I'm watching the time. <laughs> All right. So, we want to do, I think, what the New Testament describes uh, for us to do, and that is be careful how we walk, not as unwise, it says, but as wise. And then it says making the most of your time, or your translation may say redeeming the time, okay, because the days are evil, right? Listen carefully. That verse is not a way of looking at life and thinking of life in a sense that I've got to be real defensive, the days are evil. Things are bad out there. So let me make sure how I walk. I don't want to step into sin. I don't want to do that. And you don't. I get that. But that's not what the verse is telling us. It's not a defensive kind of walking. It's an offensive, an offense. It's a, it's a strategizing going forward, as it were, with your head on the swivel saying, okay, let me look for God. Let me see how God is working, how he's using that time, using that situation in my life. I want to keep my head on the swivel, as it were, and I want to, I want, I want to just keep that redemptive, eternal God view on everything. That's what it means in Ephesians chapter 5 to do, to walk carefully as you go into this world. So let me wrap it up and suggest and, and fill in your fill-ins so you, you won't be disappointed that you didn't get the last four fill-ins. Let me, <laughs> I know you guys, I know, I know me, it'll bother me too. So how should I redeem the time? How should I remember God 
a God who was redeemed and loved, given himself for us in Christ, died for our sins, saved us by his mercy and grace. How do I keep that God in the midst of the times, the seasons? I go through good ones that are going to end up and still disappoint you in the end. They're not going to give you everything you need. Or the sad and the hard times that I'm going through. How do I remember this? What are some things I can remember? Number one, you need to remember that God is sovereign. There, it says there is an appointed time for everything. Back to the poem. There's an appointed time for everything. And when it says that God is sovereign, it means that God doesn't make any mistakes in whatever time or season you're in. If you've ever read The Hiding Place by Corey, about Corey and Betsy Ten Boone's life, one night um, in the story, it's so important to illustrate this, one night when uh, the Germans were bombing their home in Holland, uh, Betsy goes downstairs to get a cup of tea and she's making noise and Corey, who's in bed upstairs, hears her. So she gets up, she goes down to the, to the kitchen and starts talking with her sister about how horrible the times are and the struggles they're going through and it's just a scary, scary time in their life. And then after their time tea, having the tea and talking, um, Corey goes back up to her bed and she fluffs her pillow like that and she slices her hand wide open because some shrapnel from the bombing had fallen through the roof and under her bed. And she goes to her sister, Betsy, and she says, Betsy, if I hadn't have heard you in the kitchen, I would be dead. If I hadn't have heard you and come down and, and if we didn't have tea, if we didn't talk for that time, I'd be dead. And Betsy looked at her and says, Corey, with God, there are no ifs. There are no ifs. So you've got to look at your situation, whatever you're in, and say, God, you're in control of that. You're sovereign. Number two, you've got to look at it as the time is sufficient to do whatever God has given you. I can't tell you how many times I've had to come back and settle my heart at the end of the day or the end of things going on in my life and saying, I just, I can't, I, I'll never get it done. And God reminds me over and over again there is a time for everything under the heaven. There is a sufficient time for everything. Time you need to do it, he gives you. Number three, you want to look at this redeeming God this way. God's timing is seasonal. There's a time too, and then he starts listing all these things off, right? So God's not always working the same way in the same times, oh, same, same way in every situation. Things change, just like seasons change. The way he works change. God never changes, but the way he works definitely does change. And you got to be okay with that. you got to be okay with the fact that things don't stay the way they always are going to be. Life under the sun will have its ups and downs. But God is in control. And those seasons are seasons where he is working to accomplish his purposes. And finally, and in closing, God's timing is always surprising as I said earlier, he makes everything appropriate or beautiful in his time. Ways that I have thought in my life, I could tell, keep you here all day telling you, I thought this was the way it was going to go, but it didn't go. I thought this would happen, but it didn't happen. And what I was looking for to find my satisfaction or something I thought would dissatisfy me turned out to be something I thought, wow, God, you were right. You were good. That's the perfect thing that I need. So you see, life under the sun... S-O-N, the sun, looks way different than life under the S-U-N, life in this world. And so the question is, as we sang earlier today, is there really that way you live life in the ups and downs of life, the things that are built into those ups and downs to bring disappointment? Is your real delight and your real joy, your real love, your real satisfaction in him, the one who has loved you, given himself for you, died for you, reconciled you to God, made you his child, all by his mercy and grace. Are you looking at it through that relationship and looking at those things and realizing that God is in control, he's sovereign, it's sufficient what he's doing, it's seasonal, that things will change, and he will just surprise us at how he's working out his purposes. Are you looking at life like that? If so, you really meant it. You really meant it when you sang those words a while ago. I will wait for you. I will wait for you. Through the storm and through the night, I will wait for you, surely wait for you. For listen to this, your love 
is my delight. That's what makes me happy. That's what satisfies me. The God who loved me, who in his sovereignty and sufficient and seasonal and surprising work always shows us that's where happiness is found. Let's pray together.